Hi, it's Alistair at Electric Scotland. Uh, this is my video introduction to my weekly newsletter for 30th of March 2018. Um, essentially, uh, this has kind of been an interesting week in that there's a lot of news going on in, in, in Britain basically about the fact that we're now hitting the one year uh, anniversary of uh, Brexit. So there's a lot of uh, content in all the newspapers, both in Scotland and England, uh, about what this all means and where it's going to go and whatnot. So I will be bringing you some stories from that. Uh, we also have some coverage of the Russian um, problem. Uh, so I, again, I've got a, a report on that for you to read. Um, I'm also talking about Tartan Day because Tartan Day is the 6th of April. Uh, and in the case of New York, I think it's got Tartan Week there. So I'm covering this for you. And um, a few other interesting things. So let me first of all start with the, the news stories I've gathered for you this week. Um, now let's see. I've actually put out quite a large article about Tartan Day and Tartan Week. I bothered it from uh, Wikipedia because it's actually got quite a good, um, um, got quite a good uh, page about Tartan Day because it covers not just Canada, the USA, but also talks about uh, Scottish uh, things that are happening in Scotland on that particular day, as well as Argentina, Spain. New Zealand, Australia, Canada, USA, or, you know, so I, I thought I'd just put that together as a kind of article for you. Uh, so that kind of starts off the newsletter. Now on to the news stories. Uh, one of the things I've got is the Euro area areas deepening political divide. Um, I just wanted to illustrate that, you know, that it's not necessarily the fact that Britain is leaving the EU, it's the fact that there are signs that the EU is starting to split up. And every so often there are new articles coming out which are tending to, to show that, um, that basically parties are getting a little more extreme. Um, like Austria, for example, they've got are now a right-wing government in power, they are kind of anti-EU a bit, or they're going in that direction. Uh, Germany obviously has had a lot of political woes of late, and of course Italy has just kicked out its current parliament and is now going extreme both left and right. So it, this kind of article covers that, and I thought it would be interesting to give you a kind of feel for what's happening in the EU. Uh, the next story I have for you is um, the decades-long quest to end drought and feed millions by taking salt out of seawater. Well, <clears throat> this resonated with me because I spent many years in Kuwait. If I remember rightly, at that time, Kuwait had the three largest water distillation plants in the world. Because basically, I think only 8% of the population would have anything to drink because there was really only brackish wells in the north of Kuwait. So there was certainly not enough water. So they had to do something to bring in fresh water. And that's how they did it. They got the desalination plants in. So, but obviously it's got repercussions for like Africa where there's droughts and everything going on. Uh, and this article talks about that. And really I thought that was kind of interesting. So I chose that for an, an possible one for you to have a read at. Um, the next standard will came from the BBC. It's basically Canada's most beautifully built city. That's the saying is Quebec, which is in the French speaking area of, of Canada. So it's got a lot of lovely pictures and some really good um, reviews. So I thought, ah, I thought you might enjoy reading that. So I put that up. The next article is, uh, Future Fuel Quest Takes a Step Forward. 
This is where a team of Scottish-based scientists has developed a new technology for creating hydrogen fuel. Um, it's not close to completion, but they've made significant progress and they believe it's not far off that they could actually give you a competitive fuel, clean fuel. So again, I thought that would be interesting. Um, the next story is Tesco veteran to head Walmart's Jet.com as US grocery wars flare. It says uh, a grocery industry veteran who led UK retailer Tesco PLC's online operation was um, named president of Walmart's Jet.com e-commerce business. Now one of the reasons I picked that is that some 16 years ago, yeah, 16 years ago, when I was living in Grangemouth in Scotland, I would go online, I would place my order with Tesco for all my grocery items and veg and everything, and I would have it delivered to my door. That was 16 years ago. So in Canada now, I still can't get home delivery of groceries, and I think most people in the US still can't get home delivery of groceries. So it just goes to show that um, the world needs to move on. And I believe it's Amazon's purchase of that food company and its declaration that it will do home deliveries that have suddenly got all the, the retail giants worried and concerned and everything. And I think Loblaws in Canada said they will have home deliveries within the next two years. But clearly, as Tesla's got 16 successful years in doing this, that looks to me like a good choice for, for Walmart. So we'll see how that develops. Um, <clears> the <throat> next story I've got for you is the promise of Africa's free trade area. Africa's on the verge of the largest free trade agreement since the WTO was, was founded. Now, as there's many of those African nations are actually in the Commonwealth, I think that's where Britain could have a, an edge there. So I thought it was, again, worth reading and looking at that as possibilities for the future. Then I've got a story about Theresa May praises allies as action against Russia continues. Well, this is the, the big one of the big stories in the UK at the moment is about that Russia problem. So I thought that will keep you up to date with things. Next story I've got is on the Brexit theme. It says Jacob Rees-Mogg's speech at the Leave Means Leave event. Um, basically, Jacob Rees-Mogg is being considered by many to be the person that could take over from Theresa May as Prime Minister. He is uh, for Brexit. And um, he's actually come over very well on the media when any, he's being interviewed at any time. And I think he is a very credible uh, alternative to Theresa May. So as he's quite a significant player in the market, I thought you'd like to read his, his uh, talk. Um, and then, fun enough, there was one on Canada I came across which is, does Justin Trudeau apologise too much? It says, why is Trudeau's, Trudeau Canada's most apologetic leader? So again, I, I was quite interested. That was, that was from the, the BBC. So it was kind of interesting, that one. Uh, then Australian High Commissioner delivers valedictory speech at Policy Exchange. Um, he is the current High Commissioner of Australia and um, he's basically saying that if Britain stays in the common market after leaving um, the EU, he says he believes Britain would be irrelevant. So he's basically saying you cannot stay in the common market or the single market. You've got to get out. And if you do that, he thinks that we'll do very well indeed. So this is an Australian perspective. And I do know Australia, from what I'm seeing, is, uh, hopes to be the first to sign a free trade deal with Britain after it officially leaves in 2019. So again, interesting talk. 
Then with a year to go until Brexit, we are closer to a deal than ever before. This is actually an article written by the uh, Brexit Secretary, David Davis. And as he's the guy who does negotiations, I thought, well, this is the first article he's written for Brexit Central. So I thought that it would be well worth having a read at. Um, the next story we forgot, uh, or I've got, is uh, Forget the Remainers Who Refuse to Surrender. The great prize is ahead of us. I mean, basically, this is a very positive speech, and as I've mentioned often myself, I'm pro-Brexit, and frankly, I don't understand why we can't be more positive about it and more hopeful about it and optimistic about the future, rather than doom, gloom, and despondency of the remoners, as they say. So this is the guy that started Brexit Central. He's got a lot of credibility, and again, I thought you might be interested in reading that. Then, I've got another one that comes from Canada, is Alexander Graham Bell, Descendants, hit back after tax office of tax official queries investors legacy. So they're up in arms about it. Basically, it says a Canadian tax uh, adjudicator said, I am not a fan of his claim to fame during a dispute over tax on Bell's sprawling estate in Nova Scotia. So I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'll have to read that and see what's going on. Then that's the end of the news stories I picked for you this week. Now, Auto Electric Canadian, I put up another volume of the transactions of the Canadian Society of Civil Engineers. Um, I've also, um, I also found what they call Dense Canadian History Readers. It's edited by D.J. Dickey. Uh, these books are intended for, for younger readers. But I'm, I'm kind of thinking here that a lot of people find history hard going. And so quite often when you find good books written to the younger readers, they're actually adults can get a lot from them as well because they are lighter reading and they do give you at least some of the history. Now this is coming in actually eight volumes. Volume one is all about Canada for little folks and volume two is all about Indians. Volume three is how Canada was found. Volume four is the long trail. Volume five is when Canada was young Volume 6 is In Pioneer Days, Volume 7 is The Canadian West, and Volume 8 is How Canada Grew Up. And there's lots of little articles in, in all of those volumes, so they're not a heavy read, if you know what I mean. And you can skip a few if you don't like them and read one that you do. So I, I, I th that's now available for you to work your way through. Um, Next, I found an interesting article which says Wilderness Survival and Outdoor Education. It's an article by uh, Matt B uh, Bale, Ball, sorry, Matt Ball, in 2001. And I just quite liked his tone, so I thought I'd put it up for you to, to have a read at. And then finally, uh, I've got the fourth report of the Bureau of Archives of the Province of Ontario. Uh, and this is a whole ton of proclamations, which are quite interesting um, to read. I, I'm not sure you want to read the whole lot, but you know I think it's worth a scan because there's some that stand out and are really interesting and, and quite enjoyable reads. And then uh, there's been a couple of articles from Conrad Black, which I put links to. Uh, so that completes the Electric Canadian. Um, I might add that. The second of Conrad's articles is, our legal system is failing us every bit as badly as journalism is. <clears throat> so it's a bit scathing on both. So Anyway, there you go. Um, then on Electric Scotland, we've got um, Best Newfangled Family Tree. Um, it's, uh, she's got up the April Section 1 issue. Um, then the next one is War, The Liberator and Other Pieces. It's by E. A. McIntosh, M.C., who was a lieutenant in the Seaforth Highlanders. Um, 
thing is, there's a memoir of him in there, so you learn about him and his life. And he died in 1917, in the First World War. But uh, he left behind some very excellent poems. So you might like to just read about him and maybe read a few of his poems. Uh, next one I'll get up is John Redwood's diary. Again, Jim, John Redwood is one of the major Brexit supporters and he gave quite a, a big speech. He says, my speech during the debate on the economy. Um, now this article starts towards the middle of the page uh, because I've already got other stuff up from John Redwood. So I just basically added it to his page, but that means that the article starts maybe just a little above the middle. So if you scroll down, you'll see the, the, the subtitle in bold, and you can read from there. Then I next thing I've got is a Clan, um, Clan Wallace Society Worldwide. This is their winter 2018 newsletter. And I have to say, it's got some of the best accounts of that clan parade at the Edinburgh Tattoo. I mean, there's been tons of pictures on it, but not much writing about the details behind it. But they've got some very excellent articles uh, written by people that attended that. And so I, I, I enjoyed reading those and I hope you might too. Then um, I have another book up this time on. I think it's basically because I've been working on the Commonwealth so much that I got re-interested in in things there, but I found a book about New Zealand settlers and soldiers, uh, or maybe a, it's basically incidents in the life of a settler by the Reverend Thomas Gilbert, but it's preceded by an account of the war in Taranaki, which was a, a fairly um, important war with the local Maoris. Um, this was in uh, 1861 it was published. So again, quite an interesting read that. Then I, uh, to maintain the New Zealand theme, I also found a history of the city of Auckland from 1840 to 1920. So that's to after the First World War. So again, I thought that might be kind of interesting. It's also preceded by uh, a Maori history of Auckland Isthmus. And it's by George um, Graham. Um, and then the, whole, the other book, the, the rest of the book is by John Barr, and this was published in 1922. Then I've got a book I've had it lying around for a while, and I've just taken the time to get it up this time around. It's indexed to uh, genealogies, um, birth briefs, and funeral escutcheons. It's records in the Lord Lyon office by Francis J. Grant, who was the Rossi Herald, and Lyon Clark. Uh, this was published in 1908. They do say that it's not wholly accurate, but, and I don't think it's a, it's a book to read, but if you're a genealogist, I want you to learn more about your name and links, then that would be a, a good reference book to have a look at. Um, the next story I got up for you is the Scots Diaspora in England. Now I will say this is a three articles I got in. Uh, I've been communicating with Duncan Sim over a number of years because a number of years ago he, he wrote about the Scots in uh, Merseyside. But it was copyright of course so I couldn't use it. But I did write to him asking if he might be able to contribute some information for the site. Anyway, uh, about three years after I wrote, I suddenly got a communication from him saying he'd gone through his old emails, cleaned everything out, and he came across mine and said, oh, I don't think I replied to you, which I'm very sorry about. He said, can we talk? And so I emailed back and explained why I'd got in touch. And uh, Anyway, I suddenly got an email in this morning, and he's attached three of his articles about his research on the Scots diaspora in England. So, again, uh, very interesting. He's saying the diaspora in England is not being refreshed and therefore is declining 
in England, whereas he thinks the diaspora is growing in North America and Australasia, for example. But he's saying the English diaspora is really going. And again, he gives a lot of background because the three articles are all in PDF format and they're quite extensive uh, and quite detailed. So, well worth a read there. And then uh, I would say the big news story of this week from my point of view is I found a book on the Commonwealth of Australia. It's basically historical records of Australia published in 1914 in 19... Volumes. Wow. Um, I read most of the first two volumes and I have to say I really enjoyed it. The volumes start off talking about a, a Governor General, their background, how they came to be appointed, what they did, and how long they were there, and all that kind of stuff. Extremely readable and very interesting. And then it goes on to producing copies of the reports that they put back to the King or back to the United Kingdom and bearing in mind at that time it took a few months to go back and forward so it wasn't exactly easy communication back in those the early days but the other thing that struck me because obviously because of the 19 volumes I thought I better read the preface and get an idea of what's going on and the background to the books and by golly that preface was amazing I mean I just, I mean, having read it, I thought that's the, about the best description I've ever had about the problems of historical research. Because it goes into all the reasons why a lot of histories are actually inaccurate. But it tells you why they're inaccurate and what you need to do to try to make them more accurate. And it does say you can never be totally accurate, but you can be a lot better. And, and it's quite a long preface. In fact, it was so long. I decided that I would make it the story for this week. As I say, if you're interested in research at all, I, I, I think a lot of the comments he makes in the preface are well worth understanding and, and, and reading about. So, anyway, th there you go. That's, uh, that's basically the newsletter for this week. Uh, and as I say, I, I hope you'll enjoy reading about Tartan Day and make some attempt to maybe... If you can't get to an event, maybe wear a piece of tartan uh, on, on April the 6th. So, hope you enjoy this week's newsletter. Certainly a whole ton for you to read. Oh, and I might just add, on the uh, Australian history, I'm putting out one volume a week. Because I understand, you've all busy lives, you can't read a whole 19 volumes in one go. So I thought, well, I'll put up a volume a week, and each week you might, if you're interested in a call, you might just have a time to go through it during the week and be ready for the next one to come along. So anyway, there you go. That's it. Thanks for listening and talk to you next week.